Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorian. Now, what I've got here is a Dynasty Forge Mainz Gladius. Um, now this, together with some other swords from Dynasty Forge, were kindly sent to me a few months ago. First of all, apologies that I haven't done the reviews for these sooner. Um, and apologies obviously to Dynasty Forge for that, but as many of you know I was moving house and various other things were going on, but finally I'm getting around to it. And as you've also noticed, this has also been fortuitously timed, um, because I have always felt that when reviewing um, Roman era weapons, we should really be putting them into their correct context with the other weapons used at the time. So uh, to, to that end, I do have handy a uh, large scutum and I've got some uh, pilum. Uh, behind me as well, Pila. Um, and these sorts of weapons are very much intended to be used as a weapon set. So I'm not going to talk usually about these other weapons in the context of this video in terms of this review, but I just want to remind you all that when we're looking at a uh, and reviewing a sword such as the Mainz Gladius from Dynasty Forge, it is part of a weapon set. And whilst yes, you can go and buy this by itself and not have to own a shield if you don't want to, it is supposed to be used with a shield. So unlike reviewing, say, a sabre or a rapier or um, a montante or something, which are swords which can and very often were used by themselves, these swords were pretty much always, with some obviously rare exceptions where a shield wasn't available for some reason, um, but they were intended to be used with a shield. Now the other thing to say when I'm reviewing this um, sword from Dynasty Forge, the Mainz Gladius, which obviously there's a link to their website and to the product below, is that um, to put it into a comparison and really give you an idea of some of the things that I think could be improved about it, I do have to hand an Albion Mainz Gladius, which is the, uh, I think it's the Augustus, but it's one of their Mainz Gladius models. And I will be comparing these two. It is a somewhat unfair comparison in a sense, in that the Albion product is around 770 US dollars, uh, whereas the Dynasty Forge product is around 470 US dollars. Huge, huge difference. But the reason I'm comparing them is not to say, ah, the Albion is better. It is because I believe that Dynasty Forge could make something as good or even better than the Albion product with some changes. So let's have a little look at the good and the bad, some of the things that I think are great about this and some of the things that I think are bad and that could be improved quite easily. So the first thing to say is that when you buy something from Dynasty Forge, you get a sword and a scabbard. And as I've said in previous reviews of their products, I think this is a real uh, benefit. This is a really great thing and something we shouldn't underestimate. If you buy a, um, an Albion Gladius, for example, it has no scabbard with it. Well, a sword's supposed to have a scabbard, isn't it? You can't wear it. You potentially can't safely store it or carry it around. So you need a scabbard um, with a sword if you intend to wear it or even perhaps even store it, transport it. So having a scabbard, especially a period correct scabbard, is a great virtue. And with something like a Gladius, as you can see, it's not a simple bit of leather or something like that. It is a wood-lined leather covered, covered scabbard with very specific metal fittings. And if I uh, bring these up to you, you can see that these have actually been sculpted. Historically or not, I won't go into that right now, um, but they are of the right sort of character for a high status uh, Mainz Gladius um, of, of, of this period. And, you know, I think that we shouldn't underestimate what you're getting included in the price. So whilst it's 470 US dollars for, for the sword, you're also getting the scabbard in. And if you bought another Gladius from another maker, and you had to go and get the scabbard separately, the scabbard would potentially double the cost of that item. Making one of these scabbards is an expensive proposition in and of itself. And I have to say also that if you're a reenactor um, or you want something that is super, super historically accurate, this scabbard might not meet your requirements. It, you might not feel that it is correct enough, but it could produce a basis, if we just get rid of the sword for a second, and I'll look at the sword by itself in, in a minute, it could provide a basis. I mean, you've got a decent wood liner, you could easily change the leather covering if you wanted to. The fittings could be modified easily enough uh, with cutting and filing or anything else, if you wanted simpler um, fittings, or indeed if you had other fittings uh, to put onto it. So indeed, this scabbard is worth quite a bit by itself and is, is pretty well made, pretty, pretty um, sort of robust construction. 
In terms of its historical accuracy, it's uh, probably about a, a 70%. It, it is not, it's not really there. It might not be up to the top level of kind of living history uh, grade, but for most people it's going to do the job and it kind of looks um, roughly of, of, of the period. And the decoration has been somewhat researched and is based on, sort of based on historical precedents. So now, putting the jangly scabbard down, let's have a little look at the sword. So first impressions are, it is a well-finished and solid object. Now, full disclosure, when this came to me, the hilt was actually loose on it, which was a huge disappointment because of the swords that were sent to me uh, to review, this was the one I was most looking forward to getting my hands on for a number of reasons, partly because I've been wanting to do Roman era videos for a while. And, um, I wanted to talk about the Gladius and the uh, Scutum used together and just the Gladius and the Scutum separately in general and uh, at the time whilst I've had a Gladius blade for a while from um, from another maker uh, I haven't got around to having it hilted up so having a Gladius to use in hand for videos was very very useful for me um, so I was looking forward to getting it and I was somewhat disappointed to find that the hilt was loose when it arrived now Firstly, I would say that is disappointing. If you've paid 400, you know, nearly 500 bucks for a sword, you'd expect the hilt to arrive tight. And I would say, feedback to Dynasty Forge, it's important that when you send these products out, um, they are checked, that they are tightened and as tight as they should be. On the flip side of that, it's not a bad problem. It's not a not a, a really um, you know negative point because these have threaded um, tangs at the end with a nut, a recessed nut. So if we just have a little look at the uh, pommel end for a second here, um, so you can see that little knob there is actually the end of a nut and it has a section going down onto a thread inside and this is essentially like a large washer. The pommel um, incidentally is made in two halves. Now funnily enough uh, when I first went to tighten this up and I should say just to finish off my previous point it was very easy to tighten up so a simple matter of tightening that nut and then actually turning one half of the pommel tightened it all up and it is utterly solid now um, such that if I just kind of bash it with the flap on a, on a shield it is totally rock solid no problems at all okay um, so it was so it was a it was an issue that was easy to uh, to remedy um, but what I would say is that when I first found that the pommel was made in two halves I was somewhat surprised by that and thought oh that's a bit weird and modern but I've since then uh, because I, I do actually have some quite good books on Roman arms and armor I'm flicking through through those not very long ago in fact I did find that some of these Roman pommels were actually made in two halves or at least there are archaeologically surviving half pommels for these gladii. So there we go. Uh, maybe, it, maybe it's historical. Um, if you know more about Roman arms and equipment than I do, then feel free to comment underneath. But it does seem that some gladius pommels were made in one piece and some gladius pommels were made in two pieces. And when you see the shape of them, it does make sense to some degree to make them two halves. So anyway, it was easy to tighten up. Um, in terms of the, the product, uh, what it looks like at first sight, it looks nice. My immediate response uh, to my visual response to seeing it is that I don't like the finish of the wood of the hilt. Okay. So sorry again to use a perhaps an unfair comparison, but if we just pick up the Albion, you will notice that the Albion is made of a dark wood that is finished in quite a natural satin finish, uh, probably just with a, a, an oil coating and it doesn't have any applied modern products to the, to the wood as it were. So it looks like a historical artifact, it looks like a historical thing at least in the hilt, and I'll talk about that um, subject in a second. Um, whereas this one is very clearly, at least it seems to be anyway, varnished. Um, and I think that that is a really bad mistake because I don't think that this sort of wooden object in the Roman era would have had that varnished fitting. It looks a little bit like a piece of furniture that you might buy from Ikea. And it just doesn't look right. It doesn't have that. It just doesn't look like a historical artifact to me. It's too shiny, a little bit too plasticky. Now, you could easily remedy that with some sandpaper. And I probably will, actually. So just sandpapering down this surface and just bring it, you know, wet and dry sandpaper, perhaps even wire wool, steel wool, uh, just bring down that gloss. It would make it look a little bit more like uh, something that could be made in period. In terms of the metal fittings, they are of a brass alloy. Now, 
purely uh, historically speaking that is not super accurate um, although copper alloys obviously were used very very widely but it has it has a sort of quite goldy look to it that looks a little bit modern and there is some fake aging on it um, I don't know if you'll be able to see let's try and get it focused in here there is some sort of essentially uh, not dry brushing but the opposite of that I suppose a wash applied into the recesses uh, to kind of bring out the contrast I suppose uh, make it look like oxidization in the recesses now that is a nice touch that they've tried to do that um, but it does look a little bit modern a little bit fake I personally would like them to use a metal alloy uh, brass alloy copper alloy that is a, a little bit darker a little bit duller um, so something a little bit more bronzy colored rather than brassy colored I think that it would look better as a product then so essentially what I'm talking about doing is bringing down the brightness bringing down the kind of garishness of these fittings down to a slightly darker alloy color a bronzer color and of course bringing down the kind of shiny showiness of this wooden hilt I would also perhaps suggest using a different wood for the hilt I'm not sure actually what wood they've used for this but it's quite a reddish color um, but anyway that's fine uh, they used lots of different woods and bone and ivory and all kinds of stuff for these original um, gladii or glad plural of gladius now on that topic I just want to say so before I go on talking about the minutiae and the little details of this gladius and comparing it to the other one it is fair to say there is a huge amount of variation there was a huge amount of variation in the gladius in the sword produced for the Roman army and in fact for civilians as well during this period so to a certain degree it's somewhat difficult to say oh you know the shape of this blade is more correct than the shape of that blade that's not that's not the sort of thing I'm going to be saying because the fact is we have surviving examples with blades that look more like this and surviving examples which have blades that look more like this there are lots of lots and lots of different and the, different types and different variations so even just within the subset of the Mainz gladius so you've got you know you've got different for you've got um, Mainz and then you've got Fulham type which is a subset of that you've got the Pompeii type so on so on um, even within those just say the Mainz gladius you can find a lot of different uh, proportions within the Mainz gladius type blades so some are longer some are shorter some are fatter some are thinner some have uh, a flare here more uh, some have a longer point some have a shorter point some are wider at the base and taper so there's a huge amount of variation now let's talk about the blade of this sword so instantly there is one thing that I much much prefer about the um, about the dynasty forge blade compared to the Albion blade now bear in mind and I've said this about Albion's before these are expensive okay Albion are an expensive product and I have always felt that their rather kind of modern looked satin finish doesn't really look like a hand satin finish it looks like a machine satin finish I don't really think is um, I don't think it is worthy of their price point so I think when you're paying as much as Albion charge for their swords they should have a better polish on them either that looks more like a hand finish or that looks like a mirror finish now Dynasty Forge coming back to what I'm actually reviewing um, Dynasty Forge have a high mirror polish on their blades and I actually think that that's good I don't think that all swords historically had a mirror finish on them in fact I'm certain that most Roman gladius gladii uh, did not have a mirror finish on them but I do think if your choice is between doing what looks like a machine satin finish or a mirror finish well a mirror finish is a mirror finish okay a hand mirror finish looks like a machined mirror finish because mirror is mirror within certain bounds whereas a satin finish if it's not done right can look very machined and modern so I think that a mirror finish on this looks great this is supposed to be a high status remember the decoration on the hilt the decoration on the scabbard this is supposed to be a high status um, Roman gladius of the Mainz type so I do think in this situation a mirror finish is fitting and it looks great I think now I know that lots of you will be no Matt we totally disagree with you we prefer a satin finish because it looks more brutal it looks more fighty more like something that a soldier would have the mirror finish reminds you of wall hangers and stainless steel and fantasy swords in uh, in the local mall or wherever and you know I, I completely understand that and in some ways I agree but at the same time we have to own 
the fact that many, many um, good quality historical weapons had a mirror finish on them. The fact that modern replicas uh, made of stainless steel often have a mirror finish. We shouldn't let that um, mar or kind of uh, divert our uh, kind of attention to the fact that a satin finish is sometimes essentially just being done because it's an economy thing. It's not being done because it's historically correct. Okay, so anyway, I'm going to stop talking about the finish on this. This I like the fact that this is a mirror finish and I like the way that the blade is made, okay? So it's a good, I believe it's 1060 steel, hand forged, um, and it, it has a brilliant single bevel, okay? So there's no secondary bevel, it's a single bevel, and this is something that Dynasty Forge, uh, basically all of the uh, swords that I have seen, and um, I have, and I've tested and handled of theirs, this is something Dynasty Forge do absolutely fantastically. And in this price point, in this price range, that's actually very impressive to have a good edge with a single bevel. Um, so that's great. In terms of the general look of the blade and shape of the blade, great. It does fall down in two ways, okay? The two ways that it falls down are, number one, sharpness. So it is sharp-ish, okay? I can probably cut through milk bottles, but not that easily through Coke bottles. As you can see, I'm not really gripping it hard, but I can run my hands over this edge. This edge to make it really test cutting, uh, backyard cutting worthy, will require a little bit of work from uh, my stone, from my DC4 stone. Okay, so that's the first thing. The sharpness is not amazing, but it's okay. And it is a single bevel edge, so it should be pretty easy to bring that up to really, really sharp. Um, the point is wicked sharp. Uh, this certainly doesn't need to be any sharp. I mean, it's like a needle, literally like a needle. Okay, so very sharp point quite sharp edges, I'm not quite as sharp as I would have liked. The second and slightly more important and negative point to mention about the blade is it's a little bit overweight. Um, not massively, but if I pick up the Albion, for example, the Albion has enough distal taper and is thin enough that it feels very light and wieldy. When I move the uh, Dynasty Forge sword around, it feels more like a chopper, okay? It feels more like a uh, cutlass or something like that. So it's not that it doesn't feel like a real sword. It does feel like a real sword, but for the for the purposes of the Gladius and with the way that it's used, you actually want quite a quick, nimble sword that's predominantly a stabbing weapon, and it might be done for slashes and quick, you know, hooking cuts and uh, little uh, opportune little cuts, but mostly for stabbing. So you actually want quite a light, nimble weapon, and uh, this is actually quite a beast for its size. Um, this is as I haven't actually uh, weighed it, I have to be honest, but you can find the stats on their website. But in terms of how it feels in the hand, it basically feels quite blade heavy. Now I have been uh, honoured with actually handling an original um, Gladius blade in the Royal Armouries in Leeds, and the blade was light. It was super light, okay? Now I have another replica Gladius blade made by a very good maker who I won't plug in this video. Um, and that feels much like the Albion blade. It feels very light and nimble. It's a, not a big sword. It's a fairly small sword. Um, so I do feel like the Dynasty Forge Mainz Gladius is a little bit chunky in the blade. And I think if it was just uh, had a bit of distal taper or it was just started with slightly thinner stock, then it would make a big difference, or maybe if it was hollow ground, it would make a big difference to how this felt in the hand. It feels just a little bit on the heavy side. And as you can see, it's not a particularly broad version of the Mainz Gladius. It's actually a fairly narrow one, although it is quite long, it has to be said. Um, for a typical Mainz Gladius, this is probably a bit closer to a typical one. A uh, little bit broader, a little bit shorter. You can see that the Dynasty Forge one is a little bit longer and a little bit narrower, but it is super, super thick, okay? Which is why, I mean, it's never gonna, I mean, that will thrust through anything, it'll thrust through car doors easily. But um, it's, it does feel a bit too chunky. Right, the other uh, major criticism I have is the length of the hilt. Now, many of you will know that I go on about the length of hilts quite a lot, and that is because many modern reenactor swords and re replica swords, this is one thing that they often get wrong with many, many sword types, whether it be with 
copying 19th century sabers or whether it's um, Mameluke type uh, swords, shamshirs, things like this, kilich, whether it's Viking era swords or indeed, or medieval swords as well, um, arming swords, or indeed when we talk about Roman swords. Now, before I bang on about this more, I just want to reiterate the point I made earlier. There is a lot of variation in Roman swords. If you just start looking for archaeologically found Gladius or Spatha, um, then you will find that they vary a lot in blade type, blade length, blade width, uh, hilt style, uh, guard and pommel style, grip styles. Many types of grips have been found archaeologically and, of course, therefore, proportion and length and weight and thickness. So. Well, you could say that this is not unhistorical, okay? And I would sort of agree with that. I don't think it's necessarily wrong, historically per se, but it is probably atypical. The Albion is more, uh, more of a typical grip length for a Roman gladius. And quite simply, it is as long as it needs to be. The general rule with um, whether it's Bronze Age swords or Roman swords or uh, even Indian talwars or whatever, is that if you've got a hilt that is not being held the thumb up or the finger up or something like this, if it's being held in some form of handshake grip or, or fist essentially, then it is going to fit the hand. The guard should be against the top of your hand and the pommel should be against the back end of your hand. And that is how big the hilt should be. I've got relatively large hands. I just bought some new bicycle gloves actually and I had to buy extra large because the large ones were so I, you know, I've not got small hands, but I have got too much hilt sticking out here. Okay, the fact is that if I hold, if I choke up right against the guard, I can't even feel the pommel of the sword. And actually the pommel is a useful leverage point when using this type of sword. So quite simply, just like lots of modern made swords, the grip's too long. And that's a real, real shame. I think it also spoils the look of the sword. If you look at the proportions of it, I actually think that the sword would look better with a shorter grip. It would look certainly more like a typical Roman gladius, Mainz gladius. But, just to reiterate for the third time, there are variations. So if we look at original archaeologically found Gladius and Spartha, or Gladii and Sparthae, then you can find ones with longer grips. So it's not wrong, but it's not, I think it could be better. So, I'm going to start to wrap things up. The long and the short of it is that the Dynasty Forge Mites Gladius, there are lots of things I like about it. There are a few things I don't like about it, but I do think that if they're willing, Dynasty Forge could improve those things. And the two, well, the three, actually, the three main things that I've mentioned, I've mentioned various things, but the three main things that they could change that would make this into an absolutely gorgeous uh, replica Mainz Gladius are, number one, the blade needs to be lighter. That can be achieved either with distal taper or just making the center spine slightly thinner or hollow grinding the flats. Okay, so number one, the blade needs to be a bit lighter. Number two, they need to change the finish or varnish or polish that is on the hilt. It looks too modern, looks like fur modern furniture, doesn't look right. Okay, so it needs to be matte finished and done with oil, uh, not this kind of glossy varnished finish. Okay, and finally, the third point should be very clear. The grip is too long, not by much. It could be shortened by maybe only a centimeter, um, but it is just a bit too long and doesn't quite look right. I personally also like a pommel that is a slightly, um, uh, maybe slightly wider in proportion to the height. So the Dynasty Forge pommel is quite high relative to its width, but that's a really, really minor point. So three points. Blade lighter, varnish off, make it a nicer finish, and grip shorter. Other than that, <laughs> I actually think this is a really great product. And you know, if you've got 500 bucks spare to spend on a Gladius, I don't think this is a bad option. Um, uh, you might know better options out there, I don't know. Um, I have seen some of the really cheap options uh, made, in, uh, made in India from other companies. I won't, I won't name them on this video because it's unfair. Uh, the, and they are definitely lower quality. Uh, but, you know, you might have other suggestions for other companies that are making decent things. Uh, but, so I think it's good, but it could be great. So what I would uh, challenge Dynasty Forge to do is to turn this from what's essentially a eh, quite good 
shared replica into a really good replica because it's clear that they have the manufacturing quality and know-how to make this a really top-notch product that is as good or better than what a company like Albion can do. So why not do it? I hope this has been an interesting and useful review. Um, I will see you again soon for another review or another general video on the Scholar Gladiatoria channel. Give us a like and a subscribe if you haven't done already. Cheers for watching. Bye folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.